let me start by asking you, is ageing a disease? That is a really great question. It's a real sort of topic of controversy and debate within the field. I think I just about fall on the half of the camp that says that aging isn't a disease. And that's more for any sort of sociological reasons than biological ones, which is to say that, you know, I don't want to tell everyone over the age of 50 or 60 or, you know, where would we even draw the line that they are quote unquote diseased, you know, just for having lived on this earth for a certain period of time. However, the biological argument is, you know, somewhat compelling. Perhaps it's not a single disease. Perhaps it's some people like to call it a disease syndrome. I don't really think that sounds a lot better if I'm honest but the idea is that aging well I describe it in my book as the world's biggest humanitarian challenge and that might sound slightly strange just as describing age as, as a disease might but the reason you know the thing that both of these ideas are getting at aging is the single largest cause of death in the world today bar none and that's because aging the aging process the biological changes that happen in our bodies as we get older they're responsible for cancer they're responsible for heart disease that you know dementia stroke wrinkles frailty gray hair all of these things you know some of them deadly some of them not but they are all essentially caused by the same biology and if you add together all the different age-related causes of death it's something like 70 percent of deaths globally not just in rich countries but all around the world are caused by the aging process and so I think that's you know why people might want to call it a disease why I call it a humanitarian challenge because it really is this enormous sort of hidden pandemic most of us just accept it as a natural process but actually it's such a crucial part of our medical system going forward uh, you're not saying though are you that people can live forever that you can you know of the two certainties of life death and taxes you'll go you can make them just one certainty of taxes because you don't need to be certain about death that's not what you're saying that's very good yeah so a lot of journalists do say so what about immortality uh, phrasing that question in the negative is definitely my favorite way to receive it because this isn't about immortality if we're talking about any kind of immortality and that's the sort of caveated version you could use that word for is something called biological immortality now what does that mean it's not as uh, you know sci-fi is living forever what it means is a risk of death and disease that doesn't change with time so let's have a think about you know what it means to be a human being one of the most fundamental facts about being a person is that your risk of death doubles every eight years. And this starts out relatively benign. So I'm 37. My risk of death this year is something like one in a thousand. And obviously, if you double that in you know, seven or eight years time, I'm going to be looking at one in 500. Seven or eight years time after that, one in 250. These are all you know, fairly good odds of death as far as I'm concerned. But if I'm lucky enough to make it into my 90s and unlucky unluck enough that medicine doesn't advance in the intervening time, then I'm going to have odds of death in one of those years of roughly one in six. So that's sort of life and death at the role of a dime. And the reason for this is fundamentally that all of those diseases I just mentioned, the cancer, the heart disease, the stroke, and so on, also get exponentially more likely as we get older. And so all we mean when we think about tackling ageing is trying to flatten that curve, essentially, to make people stay fitter and healthier for longer. And they probably will live longer as a side effect, but we're really not going for immortality here. So in, in ways in which I can understand it as someone that doesn't understand it, what actually is ageing from a biological point of view? It's a great question. It's sort of an active question in the field, but luckily we've coalesced around enough of a definition that we can start to think about treating it. And what I mean by a definition is we've got this list of what are called the hallmarks of ageing. In my book, I list 10 of them. It's based on a paper of the same name, the hallmarks of ageing from 2013. They've got nine. People disagree about exactly what should be on this list. But as I say, there's sort of a broad consensus emerging. And these are changes that happen in all of our bodies as we age. And they seem to accelerate multiple aspects of the ageing process. So this can start with the very smallest structures inside our body. So for example the dna that's the instruction manual at the center of every one of our cells all the information that's required to you know make a human being to make you and you can accumulate mistakes in that dna as you go through your life and the most famous consequence of that of course is cancer mm. which is effectively a disease where you get too many of these mutations and the cell starts dividing uncontrollably and that's obviously how that disease arises sort of zooming out a bit i'm not going to go through all 10 just as a relief <laughs> to the listeners here but zooming out a little bit we can have problems not just with what's inside the cells but we can have the cells themselves become old there's something called a senescent cell which is just a biological term for age aging basically these are cells that are sort of old clapped out maybe they've divided a lot of times maybe they've just got a lot of damaged dna so it sort of relates to other hallmarks and that means that stopping dividing they stop fulfilling their function in the body and they go on to cause a whole range of age-related problems and then zooming out even further to perhaps the sort of biggest hallmarks these can be dysfunctions of whole systems in the body and one that we've been really reminded of in the last couple of years unfortunately is the immune system so as you get older your immune system gets increasingly bad at fighting disease and that's why covid has been so much more severe for older people so as a result of all these different hallmarks working together Together, that's what causes this increase in risk of disease and increase in risk of death. And that's what ageing is. It's an increased risk to diseases. So in that sense, can, it, can somebody die of being old? It's interesting. So this was, uh, I think, actually made uh, disallowed on death certificates in the UK 15, 20 years ago. Yeah. Because dying of old age, you know, it isn't really a, a, an actual cause. What caused that person? You know, what caused their heart to stop beating? What caused them to actually die? And 
almost always there is an identifiable cause and you know it might be something like a heart attack it might be something like dementia gradually getting so bad that it strangles the cells in the brain that are vital for function whatever it might be but i think it's really important that we don't think about dying of old age in the way that i think we're used to because i think the sort of old-fashioned picture of this is that you get to a certain age you know you, you just go to bed one night and painlessly in your sleep you don't wake up the next morning but actually of course what really kills you is this accumulation of various different problems it's often not just one single disease that takes you out or that might be the thing that you know strikes the final blow most 80 year olds the average 80 year old has five different medical diagnoses and is taking about the same number of pills to fight those various different problems they've got so you know this really is sort of gradual attrition of your independence your ability to live your everyday life and that's what i you know what i really think about when i think about people dying of old age is that huge sort of burden of suffering that comes along with it so what what we're aiming for here then in in the process of anti-aging or you know allowing people to live longer is is uh, going after those signs of aging and just keeping them higher. So your ability to stave off disease is kept at a high level of someone, say, in their 30s, um, and how you go about doing that. So, so let me ask you about the evidence for this. What, mm. Where is there evidence for, and how, what does it look like in reverse engineering aging? So I think the way to think about this is that we want to target those individual what are called hallmarks of the aging process, so these individual parts, sort of component parts of the biology that change as we get older. And thankfully, for anyone trying to talk about this, both the easiest example is also the one that's furthest advanced in terms of medical developments. So this is uh, something called a senolytic drug. So seno, just from that word, senescent meaning aged, and lytic just basically meaning it kills these things. It kills the senescent cells that are found in our bodies. And these experiments so far have been mainly done in mice, but there was a 2018 paper which looked at a bunch of mice it waited until they were pretty old they were sort of 60 months old now mice obviously live a lot less long than people do but they, sorry sorry they were 24 months old which means they're about 60 years old equivalent in human years right. so you know you've got to do this this little conversion because obviously anyone who's kept a pet mouse knows they don't quite live as long as we do but having um you know given it to these sort of late middle-aged mice what they found was the mice that had, had this senolytic drug they basically you know had their biological age turned backwards um they lived a little bit longer which is obviously a good thing but they weren't sort of hobbling along in ill health, having had the protracted, you know, period of old age somehow elongated even further. They were, um, they were, they were free of disease. They had less cancer. They had less heart disease. They had fewer cataracts. Um, they were fitter, so they they have little mouse-sized treadmills. They're using these experiments, and they were able to run further and faster on those. Um, they had better cognitive function, so you could put one of these mice in a maze. Now, a young mouse in a maze in a new environment is really excited to sort of explore, find you know, find out where the food is, whatever that might be. Whereas an older mouse is often a bit more anxious, a bit more sedentary less willing to explore but the um the mice that had, had this senolytic treatment seemed to have some of that curiosity rejuvenated and finally uh, you know not to trivialize this but they just looked great you know if you <laughs> if you look at some of these photos of these mice online you see the mouse that's had the drug the mouse that hasn't had the drug they've got thicker better fur they've got less gray fur they've got plumper skin i'm not a mouse expert by any means but even to my wildly untrained eye they just look fantastic and what this really shows us is that these senescent cells they aren't just driving the cancer they aren't just driving the strokes they're driving you know potentially even the whole aging process mm. and so hopefully by giving these drugs to humans we can reverse the aging in them too and delay you know much or perhaps even all of aging uh, by attacking one of these hallmarks has that started to happen have we started so human that trials there are human trials of these drugs, wow. and I think this is actually a bit of a pattern that's going to follow for a lot of anti-aging treatments. It's currently very hard to get a drug approved for aging because, you know, as we discussed at the beginning, aging isn't really thought of as a disease. Yeah. There's also this problem that the trials just take a really long time. So your risk of death at age 65 is about 1%. That's that's still pretty good odds. You know, if those odds were to continue, you'd live to be 165 on average. So, you know, you're not likely to die in the next year or two or three, fortunately for 65-year-olds and, you know, anyone who's listening. Mm. But what that means is that if you want to do a trial or you give a bunch of 65-year-olds a drug, you're going to have to watch a lot of 65 year olds for a very long time for just a handful of them to die and then for you know say you've got a treatment group and a control group in order for there to be a difference between the people getting the drug and the people not getting the drug you're going to have to wait even longer so currently these trials are very tricky so what's going to happen instead is these senolytic drugs are being prescribed for specific diseases where we know that the senescent cells are a problem but as we start to understand more about how they work uh, you know obviously they need to help the people with those diseases but most importantly if they're safe so they don't have any serious side effects we can start thinking about you know dishing, dishing these things out more widely and eventually you know as we try them on less and less serious conditions eventually you know we might be thinking about dishing these things out prophylactically to people who are just old enough to have accumulated enough senescent cells that it's worth a sort of preventative clear out how long do you think people could live towards then on, on average 
It's a fantastic and incredibly difficult question, and it's obviously a very natural question to ask. You've got to think about, you know, what this means from a medical development point of view. And I'm, you know, let, let's take the example of someone who's middle aged now, maybe they're in their forties or something. Even, you know, with completely normal modern medicine, if they have a reasonably good diet and lifestyle, they can definitely expect to live into their eighties, maybe into their nineties. And so, what does that mean? It means they've got, you know, four or five decades of medical science ahead of them. Now, I imagine these senolytic drugs they could be available in the next 10, 15 years, something like that. What that then means is they can benefit from these first rounds of anti-aging treatment. And again, if they can sort of, you know, eat well, exercise, do all the standard stuff, maybe they could live another five or 10 years longer still. That's another five or 10 years longer for scientists to make these developments. You know, in the more advanced, you know, the stem cells, the gene therapies that I talk about in my book, these, um, they're more advanced than just a pill, but they're not sci-fi. They're certainly not something I'm expecting to be waiting a hundred years for them to be turned into medical practice. So it's really, really hard. It depends partly on how much funding we give this kind of research. And obviously, you know, medical research is just hard. It basically depends on luck. So it's really, really difficult to put a hard figure on this because we're at just this, this really exciting and critical stage in the science where, you know, almost anything is possible. So you could, uh, in th do you think then in our say in our lifetimes we're about the same age but in our lifetimes there are going to be people who on average live to a hundred and possibly many more beyond that because of the advances in this these kinds of treatments for aging i think that's likely and i think actually it wow. might be you know even more than that because if you look at the trajectory of life expectancy there's this fantastic graph that looks at what's happened to life expectancy around the world you know over the last 200 years or so and in the top performing country there's this almost suspiciously straight line performance it's about a quarter of a year every year so three months a year life expectancy increase in the top performing country and if you extrapolate that out and there's you know this is a trend that shows no signs of slowing down then kids who are born in the 2000s obviously we're a little bit older than that the two of us but you know they can expect to live into their hundreds and that means that you know we're, we're already you know we're hot on their heels you can probably expect to live into our late 80s or 90s and that means it's not going to take a huge you know moving of the needle in medical science terms just to be getting into our hundreds or you know maybe even beyond and they're not going to be these 110-year-olds, um, geriatric, nightmarish, ill health all the time. These are going to be healthy, older people because the, um, the thing, ageing, that makes them more susceptible to those illnesses will have been suppressed by whatever the drug is that helps them to suppress that ageing. Exactly. And I think right. that is the most important thing because nobody wants to live to 120 but spend no, their last 40 years really in a nursing Ill. home. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the, the best example of this actually is people who currently make it to the age of 100. So these are people who've got, you know, basically they've won the genetic lottery. They've probably got older parents or you know, parents who made it to these incredibly advanced ages. And what we find is that these so-called centenarians, they basically defer the aging process by about 20 years compared to people who live in the, you know, the rest of the general population. The average person who makes it to the age of 100 or beyond is actually living independently until the age of 100. That's not to say they've got no effects of aging, but they're clearly deferring that whole process. And so I think, you know, this shows us biologically it's possible. The question is, can we you know bottle whatever it is they've got turn it into a pill and you know give it out to the rest of us and then i i, I mean f i was going to ask whether we want to do this but i'll come on to that in just a moment about um where we are in actually making this happen because there's quite a lot of money going into this research and indeed there are some i, I think uh, jeff bezos has invested a lot of money yeah. in in starting up companies to look at this how far advanced is the science and therefore the sort of the uh, the environment to actually make this happen within our, our lifetime. It's a really interesting spectrum. And actually, I think, you know, one of the things that sometimes this billionaire investment can obscure is the fact that we do need to do a lot of basic science. So one of the things I'm really keen to talk about is that the government needs to fund some of this stuff because there are things that are, you know, so it's at such an early stage that it's too high risk for even, yeah. you know, massive net worth investors like Jeff Bezos to be particularly interested in. What's fascinating about his investment is he's chosen one of the more long shot aspects of aging biology. But, you know, him and a few other investors have cobbled together three billion dollars to re you know, really give it a good old go so hopefully even though that's one of the things that i would have put you know slightly further down my timeline maybe you know huge investments of that sort and the sort of excitement that's generating can move things along a little bit faster something like senolytics are very much at the point where you know common or garden pharmaceutical companies can actually absolutely get, be getting involved so there's a whole spectrum of different sort of levels of advancement of this stuff but i think what's most important is just that we don't you know focus on the really cool you know sort of hot topics and follow you know follow jeff bezos with his billions because actually you know wouldn't it be tragic if jeff bezos is treatment works and reverses one part of the aging process but then we all get killed in some horrible way by an aspect of the aging process we haven't invested so much in so we're at this really exciting time we're not like you know trillions and trillions of dollars away from these breakthroughs they're very much achievable but we have to you know focus on the prize and realize how huge an opportunity this is for, for you know for medicine and for all of humanity is it though i mean there are there are, there are people who who would argue that we're playing god here and we're we're messing around in something that is uh, that is so natural 
getting old and dying, that one, there's this question of, of overpopulation perhaps that, that creeps in, and two, is it something that we really want to go down and do because it's unnatural and you know, playing around with biology. What would, what would you say to that point on, first of all, on overpopulation? Because I know you get very upset about that. <laughs> I get very upset about being asked about that. But yes. I, I, the, the reason I'm upset about that isn't so much that it's something that doesn't bother me. I almost, at the end, I, I did a physics, physics PhD before becoming a biologist. And I was sort of, you know, casting around what's the most high impact thing I could do with my career. I almost became a climate scientist because I'm so worried about, you know, the problems with the environment. And I think the first thing to say about overpopulation is we're not, I really think that's the wrong word to describe this problem. Because what we're worried about isn't the people so much. It's the impact that we all have on the environment. It's the climate change. It's the plastic waste. It's the, you know, toxic pollution of various kinds the land use from farming and that kind of thing so really it's not about the people it's about how much we use and actually really you know if you drill down into the statistics on this it's actually about how much the richest say 10 percent of us use so for example roughly the richest tenth of the world population use about half or emit about half of the carbon dioxide that's emitted globally and actually the bottom 10 percent you know they emit so little carbon dioxide that we could basically eradicate them from the earth i'm not suggesting this is a policy <laughs> but we could do that and have almost no impact on our you know, future climate trajectory, for example. So clearly the issue is resource use. And we need to find a way, if we're going to bring all those poorer people in poorer countries up to our you know, quote-unquote Western standard of living, we're going to have to find a way to do so with a much smaller footprint on the planet. I think to specifically address the question from an ageing point of view, it's actually remarkable how little impact, even a complete cure for ageing, so this sort of you know, idea, if we could make a risk of death that didn't vary with time, um, how little impact that would have on population globally. So I tried to do a bit of modelling from this. I, I'm, I'm by no means a de demographic expert, but I just took the UN's population projections and effectively cancelled deaths due to ageing, because, you know, you can, you can quite easily do the sums on that. And that means we go from 9.8 billion people in 2050, which is the UN's current projection. Obviously, we've just passed 8 billion in the last mm -hmm. few months. Um, we go up without ageing to 11.3 billion. Now, is that a lot? On the one hand, you know, it's more than a billion people. It's not nothing. But on the other hand, it's only an increase of about 16%. Would I work, you know, 16% harder to reduce my carbon footprint, to do various things to contribute toward improving the environment, if that meant far less cancer, far less dementia, far less heart disease, all of these huge, huge killers, drivers of suffering around the world? Of course I would. And that's in sort of, if you're a population pessimist, that's the worst case scenario. That assumes we basically cure aging today, which by the way, you know, as, as I was sort of just, just trying to illustrate with that idea of, you know, how soon this stuff is going to be, it's not going to happen that quickly. And we're certainly not going to be distributing these globs, uh, drugs globally in that, sort of in that sort of time scale. So, you know, actually we're going to have a much more gradual uh, in in increase in the size of the problem. So I really think, although this is a really obvious first question to ask, actually it's a much smaller issue than it seems initially. And as you say here, um it challenges the bias towards the status quo of aging and dying of being old as sort of inevitable. You say if we lived in a society where there was no aging and suddenly two thirds of people started degenerating over decades, started losing their strength, losing their mental faculties and succumbing to these awful diseases, it would be, it would be unthinkable. And of course, we'd set to work trying to cure it. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think there's just this strange thing that we've all grown up, our species, you know, our, our pets, our farm animals, everything we see around us seems to age. And so therefore, we just assume it's this natural thing. It's part of being alive. And we sort of explain it away as a good thing. But actually, we're very, very willing as a society to tackle the individual aspects of the aging process. You know, we're, we're very happy to talk about cancer research. You know, you never get cancer researchers being asked about overpopulation. We invest in, you know, medicine for people with heart attacks. We invest in walking sticks and, you know, aids for people around their house to assist them in living as older people. So why wouldn't we go after the biology that's causing all of these things and more? You know, I, I just see that as an extension of modern medicine. And I think it requires a bit of a, a sort of mind shift yeah. compared to how we normally think about aging. But I think once you've made that shift, suddenly you know, it all sort of clicks together and the whole world just makes a lot more sense. And actually changes the notion of medicine, what medicine is there to do, and rather than necessarily to treat an illness that someone has, which of course it should be there for, but, but ultimately to be preventative for, from getting that illness in the first place. And if, if, if halting aspects of ageing helps in doing that, well, why the hell wouldn't you? Definitely. There's a great quote, I think, from a former health minister who said, you know, I'm not in charge of the National Health Service. I'm in charge of the National Sickness Service. Because why do you go to your GP? Why do you go to hospital? It's because you've got a lump or a pain or, you know, something's wrong with you. And then medicine is going in 
with older people essentially at the last possible minute they've got cancer but at the same time as you're trying to treat that cancer their heart might be failing they've got a bit of you know cognitive decline their brain's not working quite as well as it did when they were young you're fighting this disease in a body that's you know failing on a whole load of different fronts so it's just a, a, a basically a losing battle and that's ultimately what medicine is if you intervene at this very very late stage but if we embrace prevention and this is anti-aging medicine that we should be trying to develop but it's also the basic stuff like diet and exercise and helping people you know get more active in their everyday lives all kinds of different approaches we can tr start to make this medicine more preventative it's going to save a lot of lives it's going to save a lot of suffering and it's also going to save a lot of money so to me it's just a no-brainer finally do you think that this is that this is sort of unstoppable now that this this rise in life expectant expectancy alongside what could be the preventative um, cures for aging to the point where someone born tomorrow will be able to expect to live to 100 years and beyond I think it's really important that we don't consider it unstoppable. I think it's very likely that these kinds of developments are going to happen in our lifetime. But unfortunately, the levels of investment in this research are just absolutely minuscule. And we really need to think about, you know, concentrating on this. As I said earlier, getting our eyes on the prize, realising what a huge, huge benefit this could be for the whole of society, you know, for everybody all around the world. All of us are ageing and all of us are going to be facing down these, you know, these diseases and various consequences of the ageing process at some point. Um, but the problem is, firstly, these are very, very small amounts of money. So to take the example of cancer research, we spend less than £3 per person per year in the UK on public funded cancer research, which is just mind boggling for a disease that kills a third of us. Now, I tried to find out a similar number for ageing research. The first problem is the government doesn't even have any kind of record of how much we spend on ageing research because it's not even considered a sort of separate category. It's not something that's in the taxonomy of you know government research spending. But when you do try and cobble together the numbers from various sources, it's probably something like 40p per person per year so 40 pence into something that's got in the uk around a 90 percent chance of being what ends your life and before your life ends of course it's going to be making you frail it's going to be making you suffer in a whole load of different ways this is just mind-blowing you know to me and there's no rational possible explanation for why we spend so little on this research i'm really hopeful that even with this level of research we're going to see some breakthroughs in the next five or ten years but you know what would really really transform this is if we decided to take aging seriously we acknowledge the scale of this problem but also the scale of the opportunity here and really decided as a society to do something about it. Terrific to talk to you. Thank you so much. Thank you for your very time. much. Absolutely fascinating. And um, uh, thank you for being there for us. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Andrew.